I am tip as typical of having a terrible allergy attack in the moments before I get on stage. So pardon the tissues, they're just sort of part of my life in seven years of doing this. Uh, anyway, uh, this is called Making It Better Without Making It Over, but that's actually a terrible name. This is a better name. That first name was the name that I gave this talk before I knew what this talk was. <coughs> and now I actually know what this is a talk about. So it's a talk about this. Before I get started, let me start with a question. Um, how many of you are working on a code base that's more than a year old? And I can't actually see you, so just look around at yourselves. All right, well, that was an easy one. Uh, how about more than two years? How about more than five? How about more than 10? All right, bless your hearts. Um, <clears throat> so I got a new job a few months ago at this place called Indeed. Um, it's basically the largest job site search job search site in the world, and I don't know exactly what I'm able to tell you about how many like how big it is and how many people we see, but if I whatever I was allowed to tell you would have like a couple commas and a lot of zeros in it um, as far as how many unique visitors we see every month. And my job at Indeed is to evangelize and institute best practices around front end across the organization. And it's a new role at my company, and, and when I started, my boss and I thought that it would be good for me to rotate through a few different teams to kind of get the lay of the land before I started figuring out, like, you know, what I should do to make things better. My first stop uh, at Indeed was the team that develops the mobile job search site. So it looks kind of like this. There's really not, there's a lot to it, but as a user, there's not a whole lot to it. Um, just a couple different types of pages. You know, you enter a search, you submit the search. Um, <coughs> it shows you search results. The pages are server rendered um, using Java, yay. Uh, and then the pages are augmented with client-side JavaScript. I don't actually know how old this code base is. Um, I'm sure somebody could tell me, but it predates our use of Jira. It also predates our use of Git. Um, so this was the first commit that I was able to find from 2008 when we moved it from Subversion over to Git, and I like, it's against my religion to use Subversion, so I didn't go back to find anything else. <laughs> this is the first of 14,000 Git commits on this project. Um, and I, I didn't try to actually run the code at that first commit, but I can tell you from looking at it that it was a fully fledged application at that point that you could search and see jobs. It was totally using an old school HTML4 doc type. Remember those with the like stuff in them that didn't just say doc type HTML? Um, and interesting, there was approximately <coughs> zero lines of JavaScript in this application at this, this time. So raise your hand if you were a professional software developer when this came out. All right. I'm old, cool. Um, <coughs> This came out in the beginning of 2007, and if I had to guess, I would bet that the mobile job search site that I just showed you kind of coincided with the arrival of the original iPhone. Um, and I'm imagining this had a lot to do with the fact that the desktop site, which up until then had just been called the site, um, didn't look so great on a tiny screen. So if we think back to 2007, um, and I, it's cold in here, so I have goosebumps, but also I get goosebumps when I think about like what the world was like in web development back then. I was working at my first job as a full-time software developer at an agency, a small interactive agency in North Carolina. And I was mostly doing HTML and CSS, but every now and then they let me write some actual code using Flash, of course. Um, jQuery was, was kind of a new thing. It had come out a couple of years ago, but it was um, starting to get some traction uh, in the web development community. Of course, the logo looked like this. Um, the jQuery was neat, but people who were doing serious web development around 2007 were obviously not using a toy like that. They were using comprehensive monolithic frameworks. Um, Dojo had been out since 2004. It was like, was a long time ago. YUI from this company called Yahoo. Has anybody heard of them? Uh, I was, at a, I was at a grocery store, this was a couple months ago now, and I had a, one of those reusable shopping bags, and I was checking, and the cashier was checking me out, and I was putting my stuff in, and she was like, oh, I like your bag, because it said Yahoo with an exclamation point on the side of it. And I realized she had no idea what that was. She thought I was just really enthusiastic. <laughs> um, 
And it's, just, it's really wild to think about that, you know, it, it, to not hear, know of Yahoo then was to not know of Google now. Uh, there were other libraries like EXTJS that were taking their own kind of monolithic stabs at how we would build the tools that would be used to create the web apps of the future. What's, what's more interesting, though, to me about this time is what didn't exist. Um, you know, it's fun to look back and make fun of, like, LOL, Dojo, um, even though they did some amazing things and took a first stab at solving some amazing problems. Uh, love you, Microsoft, but you hadn't even made IE8 yet in 2008. You know, that didn't come out until 2009. Uh, Nicole Sullivan's object-oriented CSS, which was the first attempt, um, first kind of widespread attempt to figure out how we rationalize CSS and organize it and make it maintainable over a large project or multiple projects, that was still two years away in 2007. It wouldn't be until 2009 that Ryan Dahl would show up at JSConfU and talk about his stab at running JavaScript on the server. Of course, we had Rhino before that, but um, this, this hadn't happened yet, and it was going to be transformational. And NPM wouldn't come out until a couple of years later. 2009, we also got Underscore. It would be three more years before John David Dalton would say, oh, Underscore is stupid. You should use Lodash instead. And Backbone was the kind of follow-up to Underscore. Um, and that was the first actually lightweight client-side application development framework that, uh, speaking personally, that, that was the first one that felt accessible to someone who had kind of grown up on jQuery. You know, things like Dojo and EXT felt just overwhelming, especially if you didn't come from a background of maybe Java. And Backbone was the first thing that put out in front of me, like, oh, we can be better at this, we can be more organized at this. And it did feel accessible to people who may have a non-traditional background. When these devices with tiny screens first came out, we didn't have any shared understanding of how to deal with them. There were companies in the early 2000s that had taken some stabs at this with making websites that would work on different size screens, but it wasn't until 2010 when Ethan Marcotte would give us a name for that in responsive web design. And though other module loaders came before it, the first commit to a web pack wasn't until 2012. And we'd have to wait until 2013 before we saw two Facebook engineers get up on the stage at JSConf in Florida and basically get laughed off the stage for suggesting that we might put XML in our JavaScript. Uh, and of course, it took another couple years before we realized, oh, maybe that, that's not such a terrible idea after all. Back in our mobile app, and indeed, <laughs> things were pretty boring for quite a while. And um, when it first started, there were, like I said, approximately zero lines of JavaScript, give or take a few that were you know, in line, probably like MM preload images or whatever. No, I don't think even that was there. Uh, in, in 2009, in this application, JavaScript got its own file. And that file grew to a few hundred lines by 2011. And in 2013, there were barely a 1,000 lines across a few files um, powering this application. Funny thing happened right around then, though. Um, those 1,000 those 1, lines grew to 3,200 lines in 2014, 6,300 in 2015, and when I showed up in just a year, we had added another 6,000 lines of code to this code base, so the code base was clocking in at 12,000 lines of code. The application's JavaScript was doubling in size every single year. Uh, a hallmark of the code in this application, and, and lots of code from this era, um, is that it's heavily focused on manipulating the DOM and really not focused on the data behind that manipulation. Uh, this is code that grew slowly from just a few hundred lines of code, and there was never any moment where we said, we need to you know, have a plan for what it is we're doing here. We need to have some architecture around um, you know, how we how we decide what the state of the page is at any given time. And this was like this, this you know, let's just write a few more lines every time we need a, fe a feature was a fine approach for a long time, but sometime around 2014, that led to that doubling and doubling and doubling that we started to see. So in 2016, this, this application actually makes us a lot of money um, and turns out like, taking money from employers to show ads to people who want jobs is pretty lucrative. Um, I'm definitely not allowed to tell you how much money, um, but it's, it's a pretty healthy living. And um, it, it turns out that um, 
you know, like I said, it's a, it's a, there's a market here, and we're constantly building new features in this. We're still this, this code base that came out um, initially nine years ago, probably, is still seeing new features, improvements, and A/B tests being released one or two times a week. The problem, of course, is that the risk and the developer time that's associated with any given change these days is increasing just like that line. And at the same time, the performance of the application has slowly started to degrade. Uh, we've seen this a lot over the last year. And figuring out how to make it better is really challenging in that choose-your-own-adventure style code. And a few years ago, when I was like younger and more naive, um, I, I would have said that the only hope here was to rewrite it, you know, burn it all down, and let's let's start over. And I mean, so much of the front end conversation that we hear these days is about like this new thing and this new thing and this new thing. I think Cascadia does actually a really good idea of focusing a little bit more on first principles. But you go to some conferences and you just hear about like the latest with React and Redux and blah 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 blah, blah uh, which is great. But it's easy when you're subjected to that to feel like if you're working on one of these vintage applications, that you, you know, you're kind of lost and you're kind of left behind. And the reality is that we can't actually rewrite this. Like, we need to figure out how to make it better while it's in motion, change the tires while the car is moving down the road. And, um, you know, that, yeah, if, if you're working on a project like this, it is really easy to feel like, um, yeah, like I said, that you're just, kind of lost and the only thing to do is to start over and starting over isn't viable and so then you're just kind of sad. Um, so today I want to talk a bit about what I took away from my time working on this project um, where the mandate was to make it better without making it over. And if you're already working on an app like this, I hope it might um, put you in a slightly better place in your head. Um, and if not, I think it's fun just to kind of think about where we've come and, and some things that we can do in any application to, to make it a little bit better and more sustainable. Uh, so my first task when I started on this project was a simple starter bug. Um, I had to make sure that we were logging a certain piece of data when a user took a certain action, which seemed really simple, like I'm really good at finding my way through some code. So I went looking through the code and was like, oh, okay, here, this is where I need to do it. Uh, I need to get this piece of information here. And then I went looking at how I was going to get that piece of information from like, you know, window.initial data or whatever, all the way down to that moment. And I found this. Um, this is where I was going to have to add that one line of code. And, um, you know, zoom in here. Those are 40 arguments. Um, yeah. That was. That was good times. Uh, so we actually, uh, you know, it's 2016, and and you hear about all these new technologies, and you're working on an app like this, and you're like, wah, wah, I can't use them. Um, but we can draw from them. And so thinking about Redux, which has this concept of the single source of state, the single central source of state, that's all those 40 arguments were. What, that was the initialization function that was called when the page started. And rather than initializing with this one object, um, let's say, they were just passing down 40 arguments. This wasn't actually, this was gross, but this wasn't hard to solve. And we could take it another level. Instead of just passing an object, we could actually initialize some global state um, at the beginning. Say, thank you, server, for my data. I'm going to put that over here so that anything that needs it later has access to it. That's all Redux does. It does it with a lot of like magic and sugar. Um, but taking that principle from 2016 and applying it to um, this this code that was much older than that, we were able to come up with this, where we just pass in like, hey, here's your model, um, and here's this other piece of data that I couldn't figure out how to get rid of. Um, and then we initialize these models at the beginning. Tremendously cleaned up that, that code, and I was able to do that across several pages. The work that I had to do to do that um, was super scary, and I didn't really realize at first. Like, it seems pretty simple, but it was also scary, and probably I broke things. And I didn't really realize at first um, why it was scary uh, until I realized that I was missing something that we would just have in any modern JavaScript project, which is linting. Um, they did have the linting from the Google Closure Library, but the Google Closure Library linter cares a lot more about whether you have two spaces before 
a comment that two lines before a comment, then it cares about whether you've accidentally declared a global variable. So make of that what you will. Uh, so, so in the course of adding ESLint, um, adding ESLint isn't hard. I had to fix like 250 places where they weren't using strict equality. So that was like the day of my life. I won't get back. But um, it, what was cool about it was that as I was making these fixes and changes, um, and just tidying up the code, conversations started to happen in the team. And the team started to realize that it was actually possible to do JavaScript right, that there was a right and a wrong. And even these are really smart, smart people who are really careful and thoughtful about the back-end code that they write. But it had just kind of not occurred to them. It, it had always just seemed like client-side code was just this thing to get through and get it over with. And never really, they never really embraced that they could do this well, that they could do this right, and that doing it wrong might have consequences. And so that was a really cool um, kind of thing that fell out of that. The other, um, the other thing that I, in hindsight, kind of should have done before I tackled that, um, that refactoring the 40 arguments thing, um, is another thing that I think you can do in any vintage application, at least give you more security around the changes that you're making, um, give you more confidence that you can make big changes, and if you break something, you'll know about it. Um, and so that was just instrumenting key moments in the client-side application. So if somebody applied for a job, we were already logging that on the server side, but what we added was a log on the client side that got sent to the server saying, hey, somebody clicked on this button to apply for a job. Somebody searched, somebody filtered, somebody favorited a job. And by instrumenting that, which required me to write some Java, which was another good day, um, by instrumenting that, we were able to release more radical changes with a lot more confidence because if we saw those client side actions diminishing, we were able to know that we had done a bad release and roll it back. We roll out to just one data center at a time and so we could roll out to one data center, watch the graphs for that data center, um, see that, oh, suddenly we're logging a whole lot fewer client side search events. Maybe we broke something on the page in a certain situation. We were able to go see that. Uh, the, the last thing I want to talk about is um, performance. This is another thing that was really a lot harder to understand um, back in 2008, 2009 than it is now. Um, Chrome, which, which has some of the best performance tools these days, didn't come out until 2008. And I think it was quite some time before the developer tools really became as robust um, as they are now, or before they became anything even interesting to talk about. Uh, so back in the day, there was web page test. I think that came out in like 2008-ish as well. Um, but now we're able to use web page test, the Chrome developer tools, um, Charles Proxy, other tools like that to be able to really understand our application's performance in a way that we weren't able to before. So whereas a few years ago, we were just trying to make our best guess <laughs> at what would be performant based on reading blog posts and you know just trying things. Now we can really get real time, not real time, but near real time feedback about ideas that we have about the ordering of our resources or the size of our resources and those sorts of things. So just bringing that um, and developing tools around that has been really transformative to the team as well. So what did I learn? And that's really what this, this talk is about. I have no prescription for you of like, oh, if you're working on a 10-year-old project, you should go do these things. It's really very context sensitive to the, to the project that you're working on. Uh, but, but what I learned and what I want to share with you um, is like, it was a really, like at moments, terrible and at moments really powerful experience to kind of go back to this world where we don't have all of these things that we're, we're used to having. Uh, Tessa Thornton, who's, who spoke here last year, wrote an amazing post about how to learn web frameworks on the Shopify dev blog. Um, and in it, she says, it's unrealistic for you to learn a framework that solves a problem you've never experienced. 
I, th I think when I look at the developers working on this project, it's easy to see them being kind of, like I said, downtrodden, that like, oh, I have to work on this like old, messy, terrible code base. And, and you may feel that way too if you're one of those people, but that code base is giving you experience that someone starting with React app today is never gonna have. And if you can you know, step back and think about your application, your vintage application critically, and think about how you might apply modern practices to a vintage application, you're getting way more <laughs> experience um, and skill than somebody who is just um, you know, starting today on a brand new shiny app with all the tools that we have available today. The next thing I want to say is that um, it's easy to look back and laugh at those 40 arguments, and it's easy to look back at like, why would you choose this? Like, we know now that that was wrong. Uh, every technology decision is eventually regrettable. There's no reason to believe that, for, that if you make a decision today, that 14,000 commits from now, you're gonna be like, yeah, that was, that was a good choice. Um, and so I think that this, this also is just an exercise in empathy for me in kind of realizing that um, everyone does the best that they can in the moment that they're doing it. And that at no point was somebody like, oh, I don't care about this. Um, at, at worst, they just didn't know what to care about. And at best, they cared very much and again, made the best decision that they could with the information that they had. That graph, I mean, 12,000 lines is, um, it, it's not that big an application, so I don't want to sound like, oh my god, 12,000 lines. Um, but what's alarming about that graph is not where it ends, but it's uh, exponential slope. Um, and really, framework or no, JavaScript growth and complexity is just unbounded if you aren't intentional about making it otherwise, if you aren't constantly being vigilant and saying like, this has gotten out of hand, we need to stop and figure out how to get control of this again. Um, line count is a really poor proxy for complexity, but it's probably good enough. And keeping an eye on that, keeping an eye on your performance, uh, making sure that you've instrumented your performance so that you, even at a really, um, a really like low fidelity way, have an idea of the trends over time, uh, is essential if you're working on a project that you hope is going to be around in a few years, uh, so that you're giving your coworkers, your the future you, the tools that you need in order to keep these things under control. Um, the other thing, you know, I talked a little bit about this with ESLint. Um, the the just educating people that there is a right way and that there are things that we can measure and there are things that we can think about has really dramatically changed the mindset of this team in a really short period of time and just made them realize like I, I, can't, I want to be good at my job and now I know how to be good at this part of it. I never knew that I wasn't being good at this part of it. Now I know what to do. Now I know the questions to ask. Now I know that there are questions to ask. And so just giving them that little bit of education ab around, um, around the idea that there is a right way or a better way has been really powerful and transformative on that team. And the last thing I want to say is that um, you know a few months ago, there was the whole JS fatigue and building for the web is so hard. Um, there's so many things to learn, and I would just say, like, I dare you to go back to 2007 and try and solve the problems that we can solve today. Building for the web is better today, and I am so thankful uh, that we have the tools um, and the technology that we have. I'm Rebecca. I help people get jobs. Thank you very much.